Hello everyone and welcome to This Nintendo Life episode 179. My name is NBZ and uh, soon we're going to be 180 Bally and that'll mean we'll have to turn around in a circle and I'm going to have to record backwards, right? That's how it works. That makes total sense. We could do a, a reverse episode. Exactly. So what we do is we just reverse the audio and then just upload it. And then people have to figure out like secret codes in our backwards audio, right? That's how it works. Or they have to edit it themselves by putting it into a program and unreversing it. And then they find out. Episode 180, Mirror Mode. Mirror Mode. That's a good idea. I think next time, Valor, we just need to go back to Double Dash and we need to co-op our way through the 32-track Mirror Mode. I would love to do that. I would love to do that. (laughs) Have... we spent so much time i remember like you being at my house and being like okay we're gonna get you this trophy i'm gonna do it for you i will drive you do the weapons and like that 32 track thing must have taken like two hours right like it was a yeah. long commitment yeah it, it's a great mode i think double it's, people forget double dash has great co-op it's a great co- co-op game and like we didn't maybe play it as co-op as much as we should have but that's actually how you get a double dash yeah I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a weird time, but um, anyway, hello. This is this Nintendo Life. I'm NBZ. That's Bali. We're doing a podcast about video games and Nintendo, um, and and fun stuff like that. Um, but at the top of the show here, we just wanted to do a quick uh, message for our friends in the US of A, um, because it's the election season is coming up, Bali, um, and things kind are of heating up. In the middle up. of it, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, so uh, what are we what are we going to talk about here, Bali? Just wanted to say a few things. Um, first of all register to vote different states have different dates for the deadline but from what i can tell all those dates are different depending on your state throughout october so definitely check out when your deadline is and register to vote uh voting day is tuesday november 3rd so i think that's important to say and then we just really wanted to say to vote joe biden honestly because i think it has gotten to the point where it's gotten really bad and i think it's quite obvious how it's gotten bad and what trump has done uh and trump is a flat out racist uh not racism in america isn't caused by by trump but it is emboldened by trump and i think that is the crucial part is that lots of parents parents presidents have had the issue of struggling through racial tension in the united states but the presidential role is about unifying the country and speaking out against bigotry and um, all these sort of important things at this point in time when across the globe there are especially right-wing strongmen in lots of positions of power from Putin to Orban in Hungary, Modi in India and you can keep going. There's just some really unhealthy trends going on worldwide and Trump is the the US equivalent of these and I think we have to do everything in our power to to vote against it and you know we could have not said anything but i think with the listenership we have and you know what we what we espouse like we've been very open about our leftist values on the show and i think that uh it would have been a the wrong political move to have not said anything and it would have very much been a, a political move to not say anything and it's important that anyone with a platform great or small like we're still a pretty small podcast and yeah. we still think it is important to to say that Sure. And obviously, this is not saying that Joe Biden's the next coming of Christ, because my God, he isn't. Like, he's absolutely not my candidate if I was in America voting. Um, But like, there is a clear and obvious choice here, right? Um, So so I think, and and if you're thinking like, why are these two British people who can't even vote in an election talking about the American election? America sets the trend for the world, right? Like the American economy, everything in America impacts everything globally. Um, And so I think it is, it's just very important. Um, So... And I'm sure all of our listeners are definitely, you know, on the right side of history uh, and, and yeah. hopefully so, everyone will go out and vote. So whether you are, you know, planning on voting for Trump or had voted for Trump or, well, well done li- listening to this show for so long if you are a Trump voter, <laughs> but maybe you're, you're more someone who's prone to not plan on voting and you think, you know, it doesn't affect me. This is above what I'm interested in and I don't want to vote. I honestly think this is the right time to vote more so than, you know, Obama in 2008, more so than 2016. Like this is exactly the time to vote. Uh, or whether you're a leftist who says Joe Biden isn't my guy and I'm not, I'm going to vote third party or not vote because, you know, um, 
he's not my guy. I think that's also a bad call, uh, given the situation that we're in. And um, like I was saying, just how much bigotry uh, Trump emboldens and in particular, just um, how difficult it is in the United States uh, and many parts of the world for minorities. And that is only going to get worse in the next four years if he wins. Absolutely. So um, anyway, uh, please do that. That would be great. We'd appreciate it. Uh, anyway, let's get on with the video game part of this show. Uh, what are we going to be talking about today, Bally? Uh, so yeah, we're going to run through quite a lot of things. So we thought better to do a two-segment show. First segment, we're going to have a quick run through the the little direct mini that there was. Uh, it's like a third. Was it third? It's uh, third. It's Nintendo Partner Showcase. Partner I believe showcase. the brand is. You got to get the name right because there are about twenty different names for these things. We've got Indie World. We've got Partner Showcase. We've got Mini Directs. We've got Main Directs. We've got specific game directs. Like at some point, Nintendo, you got to feel like just make everything a Nintendo Direct and you know just deal with it. You know, it's, exactly. it's a bit too much. So we're going to run through that. We're going to talk about some of the games that we've been playing, and then for the second segment, we're going to talk through some emails that you've written in. Absolutely, uh, and it's mainly because we've got just so many games to talk about in this first segment. Um, but uh, let's kick things off with that partner direct because i i think like it's going to lean into the game we've been playing a lot of which is hades um and maybe we start there with this uh presentation because that was one of the two major shadow drops of it was hey here's a trailer for hades and it's out today uh, and you could download it straight away which is very cool because it also means that on pc it's exiting early access and entering 1.0 so it's fully released on both platforms unfortunately the cross save thing that they were talking about in the previous nintendo direct where they talked about it or indie world whatever it was um has not been implemented yet so you can't quite transfer your progress between pc and switch just yet but that i think is going to happen in the future and given the way the switch port runs on um in docked mode in terms of resolution it might be the type of thing that i'm actually interested in is is picking up the pc version because um i would like to see that on a crisp 1080 display uh, as opposed to 720 which it does run in docked mode um but it it runs great and we'll talk about it but um uh the other thing that was shadow dropped was ori and the will of the wisps valley um a video game that we both uh have espoused the virtues of on this podcast earlier in the year got an xbox for literally bought an xbox for this one video game and it turns out bally you shouldn't have done because guess what <laughs> not only did they put out this game on the nintendo console but they made it run even better than it ran on an xbox somehow question mark uh it's wild we me and you just watched a video from digital foundry about how they made this happen and i would recommend people go check that out because it's fucking crazy right it's insane i like it we when will of the West came out we were kind of very skeptical like much of the internet that yeah, this probably isn't going to come to Switch. Or if it does, they're going to really kind of nerf it in, in a visual way. And they haven't. It's incredible what they've done for that. And yeah, if you own a Nintendo Switch, and you should be playing that game. You absolutely should, especially in this year. We are going to be talking about that in Game of the Year discussions for sure. A hundred percent. Yeah. So I haven't picked it up yet because there was just so much is coming out, man. I picked up the Mario collection and then hades dropped and i'm like look there's, there's too much to be control. playing yes exactly and we'll talk about all that stuff but um i will pick ori up on switch mainly because i don't actually own it technically like i have game pass so i have access to it but it doesn't mean that i actually own it right um so i would like to have a copy of ori and the will of the wisps installed on my switch for whenever i want to play it because it feels like the type of game that you know i will go back and play multiple times over the years so that's that's the kind of thing that i'm looking to do um the main thing for the, this direct though was the new monster hunter a couple of new monster hunter games got announced we have monster hunter rise which is kind of with monster hunter world taking center stage for the big beefy hd twins and then being like the new kind of thing that capcom is pushing on um they didn't want to leave the switch audience behind because nintendo is still a huge deal in japan in terms of that monster hunter audience so it makes sense for them to have a dedicated switch based monster hunter that i don't know if they'll release it on the other platforms honestly because it seems kind of tailor-made like graphically visually for this platform um and and feels like a sequel really to the 3ds games that they made back in the day bali does this move the needle at all for you is there anything that could ever get you to get interested in monster hunter whatsoever i don't know it, it's on my list i i owning cross 
platform. I think the one that appeals to me the most from what people have said is probably World. It sounds like Monster Hunter has gradually got more and more tutorialized. And for someone who yes. likes tutorials like me, I, I do like the sound of that more probably. And I think it's on Game Pass actually, or it certainly was. But Really? Yeah, I, World? I think it was. Okay. All right. I don't but, know. Anything could be on Game Pass these days. I, I have know, no but, idea. Um, yeah, so that's probably where I would tend to rather than pick up a Switch version, but I I don't have a strong preference. No, yeah, same here. And, and I think that it definitely seems to be pleasing that crowd. Um, and that crowd seems to be growing larger, right? Like, there are definitely people out there who have now played World and they're like, okay, I'm all in on Monster Hunter now. And so I think that the sales for this one are definitely going to eclipse what was previously possible on 3DS. And um seems like there's some fun things in there. You can ride around on a dog thing who's your new companion. There's a lot of grappling hooks in there. That's one of the things I was like, hmm, yeah, I do like grappling hooks. So maybe this is, uh, is speaking to me a bit more. But... Uh, I'm sure that's going to do very, very well for Capcom. Um, But the other thing that I'm actually more interested in is Monster Hunter Stories 2. Um, So people who don't know, Capcom released a game on 3DS called Monster Hunter Stories that was essentially a Monster Hunter game that was an RPG. So it was a turn-based, more JRPG type of game set in the world of Monster Hunter, which means that you actually have characters and dialogue and stuff like that, which isn't really the case in the mainline games, um, at least not to a like pure narrative extent with a storyline that you go through and follow and uh, i have been trying to find a good priced copy of monster hunter stories for a while it doesn't seem to be one of those 3ds games that goes down in price that often um so i will probably eventually pick that up on 3ds but hey they're making a sequel to it which is very cool um people did like the first one and um it looks really nice i like the art style a lot it's uh it's kind of a softer almost uh, it, it feels more like a JRPG, right? Like it almost has maybe a Tales of vibe or even kind of like, not quite Nino Kuni, but but a softer kind of more um, welcoming art style uh, as opposed to Monster Hunter, which has always gone more down the photo... Re- I say photorealistic route as if like all these monsters are real things, but you know what I mean? Like it's trying yeah. to go for um, uh, a bit more of that vibe. So, so yeah, this is definitely the game that I'm far more interested in. Um, and then, you know, there was some other stuff in this presentation uh, that was pretty cool. I'm interested in Empire of Sin um, from uh, Brenda Romero, uh, who very long time uh, industry veteran and uh, has been involved in some of the most important games uh, back in the day, obviously, at id uh, with her husband, John Romero. And, um, and it looks pretty cool. It's kind of, I guess, ex commie set in the prohibition era of, of the US and gangsters and stuff and, and shoot, shoot, shoot outs and some narrative stuff in there as well. So of the other stuff, that's kind of the one I'm probably the most interested in. But... And that's a new game. That's not like a is it already out on other systems? No, I don't believe so. I think that is is getting its first release uh, on okay. Switch. So yes, that cool. will be very cool. Um, and yeah, I don't know. There's not much else here. There's doing they're not doing another Disgaea game. I've never played Disgaea. It looks very complicated. I want to you play can... PGA Tour. Do you though? I do, but do I, I know it'll come to Game Pass. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> 2K, once... A lot of two K games are coming to Game Pass. Yeah, and also I'm always skeptical about sports games and how they run on Switch. Yeah, right? I they probably just... wouldn't want to risk that either. Yeah. So, uh, the other thing actually I am quite interested in is Rune Factory 5. We've never played a Rune Factory, but like, no. it seems very good in terms of. I, I know lots of people who love Rune Factory, and Stardew Valley is obviously pulling from the Harvest Moon kind of vein, but it has, I guess, elements of Rune Factory in that Stardew does have a bunch of combat. Rune Factory is far more of like what if harvest moon was a jrpg right like it has all of that farming stuff but it also has more deep combat and leveling and dungeons and that type of thing so and rune factory 5 looks like a big step up for the franchise if you compare it to 4 and what 4 was like on 3ds um this is definitely a a step forward uh and it looks really good um so it's definitely one that i will keep an eye on and and i'm interested in checking out at some point Um, but yeah that was kind of the partner showcase that Ball and Wonderworld game also got shown again. Looks like the jankest ass thing I've ever seen in my life. I think it's from the Sonic team. Like, it definitely is. It has that kind of Sonic Adventure vibe to it almost in terms of this game doesn't look particularly great. Um, but whatever. I'm sure that there will be an audience for that somewhere in the world. Um, anyway. Video games, Bally. Uh, we talked about Hades as part of this partner direct. And Hades has taken over my fucking life. Holy shit. Um, 
it's you know we talked about earlier in the year about how sometimes games just come out of nowhere and it's like spirit fair it's like bang this is amazing and i didn't realize how amazing it was going to be we knew about that game and i was like okay yeah it's coming out I don't know how yeah. good it's going to be and it's like whoa this is awesome hades is one of those games that people won't shut up to me about in terms of like hades is amazing it's awesome it's fantastic it's one of the best games i've ever played so it was very much on your radar oh it was so on my radar it was the fact that like i bought it before everyone on twitter and everything went crazy about it as they have in the last week or so um i literally bought it because devon has been telling me hades 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 and i'm like all right man. like i know he's like very into roguelikes and, and always wants me to play roguelikes and i'm like yes i'm not that into roguelikes but it, like i feel like i have to change my stance yeah, you can't on... keep saying that and then say but this roguelike is really good for about exactly five honestly <laughs> like some of my favorite games of the last few years have been roguelikes if we talk about into the breach if we talk about slay the spire if we talk about dead cells like there are games now that have this repetitive progression idea that are just on another level and i think part of it is because i'm a gameplay first person right and so i will always connect with systems and with mechanics that feel good and that are satisfying and that have a good sense of of movement and momentum and all those types of things and i think that all these games do that in different ways right and because of that, I feel like I'm having to just change my stance on it as a concept because I don't think it's the concept. It's more like, what do you do with it, right? And to what extent is that concept built out in terms of progression and what you actually get in a long-term uh, kind of deal, right? Mm-hmm. Because you have games like Spelunky, which are pure roguelike, which means you really don't unlock anything. All you're doing is you're learning in your head. Your 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 brain is the progression in Spelunky, right? You are just picking up knowledge and getting better at it and understanding the game. And for me, sure, that's interesting, but it's not as satisfying as having a built-in progression in the actual systems and giving you more stuff that you can go back to a hub and put points into right like one of the reasons i really love rogue legacy was you got a bunch of gold in the castle and you use that gold to build up all of your abilities so that you could then get stronger so that you could then get further in the game right it all builds into this idea of you start out really weak and then you get much stronger as a result of some progression elements even though you are kind of doing the same thing again at the same time you are still a big fan of into the breach and slay the spire and i think what they have in common is they don't essentially give you progression they just give you more variety by progressing so like exactly um they are if you're strictly they're probably more like than light if that makes sense but they feel lighter because you you can go do another run in a very different way totally like the the interesting parts about those games is the synergies element right and i think synergies is just a thing generally that i vibe with think about my competitive pokemon days like part of the reason i love playing that so much was because of team composition that you can do combos with this and have you know my my doubles team with shuckle where i did like um, power trip and then trick room and then it was the fastest thing and also could hit everything with earthquake and the bronzong avoided it because of levitate like all these levels right of things just working together and that is what slay the spire does and also what into the breach does in terms of Ooh, this one move and into the breach i can knock this guy into the thing i can pull this guy into the water i can do all these things that just link together and create this amazing move and say the spire is the same way in terms of building your deck of like this this and this and so hades has all of that stuff as well as the progression as well as a kicking soundtrack as well as a gorgeous art style and just a brilliant narrative as well it's literally all these amazing elements brought into one package that is just feels perfect right yeah um and and yeah how, how have you been finding haiti so far bali because well, you definitely are not as down the line of playing a bunch of roguelikes as me um, yeah i mean i think i might get there i just haven't played as many at this stage I, I do like into the breach a lot what i've played with slay the spire is great i really enjoyed bad north and that's a real good example of like a very strictly rogue like one like so you do get no progression whatsoever yeah um I'm glad I waited to play this one in particular because I am absolutely loving it as well. I think I've only done maybe 10 or 11 runs. I think you're up at 25, 30 at this point. Yes. Um, so yesterday I got to... So I've been to the final boss three times now, I think. And um, yesterday I had a run where I was just stacked, man. I had all my death defies intact um i had an ability from Ares that meant if i 
if I recovered after a death defy, my attack would be boosted by 22%. So I had the potential to boost my attack by 66%, basically, if I die three times. Um, I had uh, a boon from Dionysus that was the hangover one, and I had aphrodite's weaken so it's like you're dashing through people giving them poison damage while also weakening their attacks it was just set up for perfection and i literally got down to the one quarter health of his second health bar (laughs) and i died and i lost my mind because i was so fucking close to beating it i had a perfect build it was all just like built up to this moment and i still died and i was like oh man it's a pretty gutting feeling when you feel like you've you've achieved a great build and then you get you either play badly or you know the boss just has a good day and you kind of get eviscerated and yeah it's yes it's tough but yeah I'm, i'm absolutely loving it and I love the combination of permanent upgrades uh, and then also temporary upgrades. And uh, like you've mentioned, so the, the main temporary upgrade are the boons. And these come from uh, the gods on Olympus. And you're playing as Hades' son. Um, Zagreus. Zagreus, who's basically... The gods on Olympus are trying to help Zagreus out of hell. And they're doing this through their powers and giving Zagreus these boons, which are his powers. So these are the ones that you're picking up per run. Uh, but then likewise, there's this purple currency. I forgot the name. I think it's like darkness. Darkness. Yeah, I think it's just called and darkness. darkness. You can basically spend on different things like the revives, like you were just talking about, or you can spend them on this ability to gain a bit of health when you move room. And so that's the permanent upgrade versus the temporary upgrade. But the narrative plastered over the top, essentially, of the constant dialogue of these gods helping you, uh, Hades, your father, making fun of you when you return to the house of Hades, which is like the hub base camp, as it were, um, and the interactions with the, the, like the bosses and other characters and the sheer amount of dialogue everyone has. And like there's the, even they have like upgrade trees where you can gift them things and they will return you um uh i forgot what they're called the keepsakes keepsakes so keepsakes are things that you can swap between at the start of a run um although you can actually swap the mid run although i've not unlocked that yet yeah it's not it doesn't cost that much i think it's like 10 gems to get that keepsake uh, in every single room after each boss essentially yeah so this whole combination of the characters being very aware of the roguelike nature of the game i think adds so much it makes you feel better when you die i think i think when right because there's kind of that narrative reward of like oh i can chat to achilles again oh i can see deucer again right and like all these little threads just keep moving along slowly and revealing certain things and i don't know if you've got to a point where there is a certain cut scene that you see and it reveals stuff about why zagreus is trying to escape from hades and and what his motivation there is um but i i think that will probably keep happening and from what what i've heard from people is that the story doesn't end when you escape because like you could have beaten hades on like your fifth run for example if you just get a really broken build and it may feel weird if like that's the end of the game because there are just so much dialogue and writing and narrative stuff going on here so it makes sense that you have to get through a certain point or get to a certain part of the game when eventually you will probably finish it but that might mean beating it multiple times in order to do that yeah, and, and I'm confident that once you build up a certain level of darkness, you'll probably be able to beat the game, not easily, but like more consistently. Like I think that yes. a, the trajectory is re- feels really good. I um, think certainly because I have gotten to at least the end of the third area every single run I've had since the last maybe six or seven runs, right? Like I haven't had one that has ended early because i think i'm at a certain level and part of it is like the magic mirror where you invest your darkness into the upgrades like my health is now at a base level at 100 right and you start your health is at a base level of 50 so i'm basically double my survivability from where yeah, i was at the beginning of the game 50, i should change that <laughs> oh yeah you need to invest in in that but i think i got to the third the final boss of the third area on my seventh run and i have no idea how i did it and yeah. the, the, the few runs i did after that i just got completely dominated way earlier than that it was it was crazy yeah because sometimes you will just come across a build that has a really cool combination of items and this is the thing with synergies right is certain of these elements will just work together beautifully in concert where you can have an ability that is 
giving you health with every hit you have and you could have a rapid fire ability from say the bow so if i have the rapid fire bow plus this thing that gives me health with every hit you're having each hit go faster which means that you're healing much faster as well right mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. these two things are working together to create this feeling of oh my goodness i'm just layering and layering and layering and the cool thing about it is because it's all randomized you're never going to come across something that is exactly the same as what you've had before um, and you'll definitely lean towards certain elements you like the most you know i really like athena's um god gauge because it just puts a giant shield around you and you're shielded for like 10 seconds and you can just wail on bosses and it's really really helpful um but i could choose someone else's just because there's this other kind of motivation for it there's like lots of different progression elements of the game one of them is the list of fated chronic prophecies i think and that list encourages you to choose different things that you haven't tried before because the reward is you get 150 gems or something that will then be used in upgrading other parts of the house of hades so the game really wants you to go out of your way to diversify and to not just stick to one thing that you know yeah because i remember like when i started with the bow i was like oh i got the flurry shot for the bow and i'm like i'm never using anything else but every single weapon feels so fucking good to really use does. that that is the core of this game is that it's there's six different weapons yes and they are very diverse they're very different from one another um there's definitely elements of like a lot of them have ranged options to them some of them are just pure melee but at its core this game feels fucking fantastic to move around to attack enemies the animation the sound design just the feel of the dash all of that stuff is incredible and that is like kind of the core of why you just want to do another run and another run yeah. and just keep going with it i think you sure. also have the ability to mark boons when you get them so you so if they reappear on a, a later run you'll be like oh i marked that one i must have liked it you know you know what i mean i think you can i like... don't know I, I don't know what you mean by that so if you go on your boons while you're in a run and you say so i've got zeus's i can't remember the name of them all but i've got one of zeus's ones i like i can say i can i can scroll over it press a and it'll like have a little mark on it and i think it means that when it reappears on a later run it'll still have that mark on it so you can kind of that's cool have i didn't know that um huh. yeah i had i had a few boons one run that were like when an enemy died they kind of exploded and poisoned enemies near them and then i boosted yes. another thing that meant enemies near them also became weak so i was really good at handling swarms of enemies but then when i got to the boss i realized oh i'm not killing a ton of enemies with the boss i mean there are some enemies around the boss but not like a swarm necessarily and then i got completely dominated by that boss so like trying to think of how am i going to prepare myself for swarms of enemies versus single heavyweight enemies like a boss because i think having that diversity is crucial because sure i could make a build that's prepared for a boss but then the game will always throw levels of swarms of enemies at me and i'll really struggle to like you know get through them so it's that balance that i find is really interesting and like we're saying where some of the weapons are a lot less range focused like the sword for example that's where i think one weapon that's called the cast is really interesting so the cast is essentially like this red diamond that you can throw at enemies and you can upgrade it so you get one two three casts i believe and and you'll always have a cast no matter what weapon you exactly. choose you'll have this this kind of this one ranged option for you exactly and it can be boosted by boons in a way where for example zeus's one i think turns it into like this lightning thing that will you know electrocute enemies or um i can't remember some of the other ones it will kind of chain between people right like right. you throw it and it, it goes from multiple enemies like goes to like six or seven enemies in a row to do damage to them um one of my favorites is dionysus's which is this cloud this like trippy cloud that is in a range it's like a circle that you drop down on the ground and it stuns enemies within it and also does damage and it is really good if you're trying to do a build where you are doing poison and like hangover damage and just stunning enemies it's incredible it's really really helpful yeah so. and i even managed to get some boon that married up uh zeus's ability with the cloud so it meant that when you were in the cloud you also get lightning damage so there's some boons that can kind of double up in some ways which was they're like duo abilities yeah. between the gods essentially the yeah. gods will like both come in and chat to each other real quick and be like hey we can work together to right. help zagreus here um, um 
And, and that's the cool thing about that. You yeah. know, like all this dialogue that happens with those gods, every time that you pick up an item, they'll be like, hey, and they'll like have a little bit of added dialogue with context of what has happened. One of the things I saw someone talk about on Twitter, I think it was Mike Mahardy, um, or Polygon now, follow me of GameSpot, saying that he fought Meg, and Meg was making fun of Zagreus because Zagreus was using all the abilities from the, the mirror and being like, you can't beat me without these abilities, essentially. And then Mike went back and cleared, because you can use pay one key to clear off all those abilities and, and reinvest them and stuff. So he cleared them off, and then he went back into that Meg fight, and she commented on the fact that Zagreus had done that, right? Yeah. Like, those tiny little world building things or even just things to make it feel like what you are doing is being noticed by the game it's just incredible how much dialogue is in this yeah. game and the, and the voice acting is really good like um i actually think zagreus he really his voice his performance really reminds me of uh the trevor belmont in the castlevania netflix series like he's got oh this, yeah he's got yeah. like this deadbeat tone to him and he's very almost sarcastic at his times and I think the art style also is ever so slightly reminiscent of something like that art style. But um, yeah, I, I I think the voice acting performances are, are so good. And the sound design with all the effects that the gods have and stuff, I think is just combined to make a really impressive package. Yeah, and it, and it feels like sometimes it can get a little tricky and busy on the screen when there's so many enemies swarming and, and the switch buckles a little under some of that pressure but for the most part runs incredibly smoothly as i was saying though i think because it runs at 720p docked it's not quite as sharp as it could have been which i think when i first started playing i was a little bit bummed about but you know once you get into it you don't really notice and, and it's, it's not a big deal yeah um, but but for that reason for the most part i have been playing in handheld mode and and uh, enjoying it that way and you know, it's maybe a little zoomed out just because it is an isometric view. So you are kind of looking down and, and it can feel maybe a little small, but it, I think now that I know everything and I understand the visual language of the game, it makes it a lot easier to, to kind of get through mm -hmm. handheld wise. So, so yeah, it's, um, it's an incredible game. And I, I feel like because I'm so close to beating it in terms of just finishing it for the first time, I still want to keep playing it, right? Like, and I think the game encourages that because its narrative is... I don't think... I think one of the interesting things about this, right, is everyone has their own idea of the pantheon of the gods. I think the Greek gods are unique in that most people will have this kind of natural knowledge they've absorbed um, just through cultural osmosis um, of... Zeus is the lightning god and he's the king of the gods and Hades is from the underworld and Athena is has owls associated with her because of wisdom and, and all these kind of ideas and so they really play with that in terms of what your expectations are for who these gods are supposed to be versus the kind of family drama that they espouse with it in terms of you know Hades is Zeus's brother and Poseidon is also one of the right. brothers and so they're, they're uncles to Zagreus and the idea that like this part of his family is trying to help him out and, and get him out of there and just the interactions that all these other gods have with each other um is very very interesting and and it allows them to start from this base of knowledge right like you you already have this kind of idea of oh i know who poseidon is and so it allows them to toy with it a little bit dionysus is one of my favorites because he's just like very drunk uncle like you know he's just like hanging out like very much having a, a fun time and and great voice acting on him as well um, but that stuff really lends to that sense of you know the world of hades um, mm -hmm. which i think mm -hmm. is very very cool um people should play this game <laughs> people should fucking play this game. this is absolutely one of the best games of the year i am fucking obsessed with it it is incredible i just missed the launch sale by this point which is a shame unfortunately yes uh, so it was a 20 percent launch sale which was nice um and you know i was gonna probably pick it up anyway but i think that definitely sweetened the pot made it much easier people were wild about it and it was a launch sale i was like i have to play this game <laughs> yes. and i'm glad i did yeah absolutely um the other thing we've so interesting week battle we've been playing all stuff on switch and all of it we've both played um the the second game here super punch patrol uh so if you've listened to this podcast for a while you know that we are big fans of uh, our main man Bertel horberg who is a one-man developer who made uh gunman clive on the 3ds a fantastic side-scrolling uh, Mega Man style action game um, with a beautiful art style this kind of he has this signature art style that is his sketchbook aesthetic that it wasn't really present that much in Extermination Force, which was the first game he released on yeah, Switch. Yeah, it had elements of, but was a bit different, you're right. 
it was different and i actually really liked Mech extermination yeah. forces look because it was super colorful Loved like it. very very bright and um almost garish to some degree but it, it fit that model of like this kind of opposite to what you expect from an apocalyptic world it was like yeah. just gorgeously uh detailed in terms of some of its visuals um but super punch patrol is a side-scrolling beat-em-up that kind of goes back to a similar style to gunman clive in that it was super cheap it's like five quid or five dollars on the e-shop game i believe so yeah i don't know if he's released any other things like prior to gunman clive and, and things like that but um but this is yeah it's, it's a much shorter experience as well you can probably finish it top to bottom in about an hour maybe an hour and a half at a push depending on how much you die in it um but yeah it is i would say almost slavishly a side-scrolling classic beat-em-up um <laughs> meaning that it definitely has those elements that i strongly dislike and i think it says a lot about Horberg's games that i will play whatever he puts out regardless of genre and regardless of what it is just because i really like his style and and the stuff that he he makes generally like he makes very video game ass video games and um i think the first thing that struck me about it when i first booted up was wow this runs beautifully like it's really smooth and it looks fantastic handheld and you know all the characters have this either red or blue aesthetic to them to designate this is your main player character versus the enemy characters and it's all very sketchy it it does it feels like a bit more colorful than what gum and clive was because gum and clive was much more sepia toned um versus this is a, a bit more variety in there but still sticking to a general kind of look that you would expect um, yeah. from one of these games it, it's a brutal ass brutal arcade game in the most arcade sense you can possibly imagine and yeah it, it just completely there are moments when you will just be in a corner and you can't quite clearly see all the enemies on screen and well some of them are off screen and yeah there's just certain moves so there's no block there is a dodge uh but there are just certain moves that will just do a lot of damage to you that you more or less cannot avoid and you will die a lot and you played this game before me MZ, and you said yeah you should probably play on practice mode uh if you if you want to try and beat this game kind of first time round. and i thought okay right it's a practice mode gives you nine lives and then i think you're also given is it five continues nine continues no it's nine continues nine as well, continues yeah. and i still died a ton and there was probably a point in the middle of the game where i thought i don't even think nine continues is enough to beat this game <laughs> and and i thought i'm on the easiest mode possible it's called practice mode for god's sake and i i still struggled to like i think i had like four or five continues in the end uh by the end but still i was losing at least nine lives per level and i thought right well i think there's like five levels so if i lose nine lives per level but then it takes me to the start of the level each time i get a continue that means i more or less need uh two continues per level so 10 no nine continues should work out the maths just about works out but it was hard i i think it, it i thought it was going to be tight and yeah it's really really brutal and unfair and especially coming off the back of like streets of rage 4 which i felt yes, like totally. there was hardly any unfair damage in that game i felt like if you took damage in that game it was because you made a mistake or you didn't deal with that enemy well enough whereas i think in this game there's times when yeah you're, you're just not going to be able to you know beat that enemy and there were even times where the the timer was like i got a couple of uh deaths just from the timer running out uh, did you really i I always noticed that and it was going like there didn't seem like there was a lot of time involved but i I never lost to the timer it was when i went into the mode of right i'm not going to take damage and i'd get i'd do like Ah, a, a, a jump kick to to a dive kick in order to like eat away at, at the damage of people rather than you know take them on head on and take damage so it was like i'm going to preserve my life and be very careful and the second i was more careful about it i would find myself running out of time so in that sense the game's really forcing you to be more offensive but at the same time being more offensive results in you getting your ass kicked so it's a potentially it yeah hard I wonder which character did you play as because I played as Anders who's the big brute guy he yeah just, he does so much more damage and like he is Me a little too. less wieldy but I think his trade-off was much better in terms of 
his abilities given the t type of game that this is versus the other characters the other characters are faster and have a bit more kind of clearing moves and their special moves seemed a bit better but they just didn't do enough damage per hit which meant that i was taking far more damage playing as that yeah i i stuck with anders after using him the first time i tried all of them once and i was like right anders is the guy gonna go yes. with him and then yeah he's definitely just did the most damage didn't feel substantially slower but obviously felt a lot more powerful and yeah it worked out yeah and and you know it's not just a side scrolling beat em up there are some fun other things thrown in there there's like this level where you're on a skateboard and you have to jump over you know rolling uh, spiked balls as well as dealing with guys on motorcycles coming at you like i really i like that variety and i think um you know Hallberg does a good job of doing that within his games in terms of like gum and clive 2 had those star fox-esque levels where you were like flying the dinosaur yeah. or flying a plane forward um, i really like th that change up um and so it's cool that that is in there but but yeah for me this is definitely his weakest game and i don't think it's because the game is necessarily worse i think i just fucking hate this genre like yeah. i re it is i think this has like increased my respect for streets of rage 4 tenfold because that game despite being in this genre is so fucking good right like i really love streets of rage 4 and for it to do that in a genre that i think might be my least favorite genre in video games says a lot um because it's just not for me right like i'm just not here for going across and like kind of with stiff controls as well like even the dodge feels a bit stiff in terms of double tapping up or yeah. double tapping down to like dodge out the way it doesn't feel natural um and there is a there's a clunkiness to you know being on a different plane to an enemy and are you exactly lined up with an enemy to hit them Ta that type of thing as well is, is slightly annoying one thing um, this game does differently to streets of rage which i really dislike is the special moves so in this game when you do a special move you take you automatically take damage in streets of rage uh streets of rage 4 i should say you essentially a bar appears that if you then take damage while using a special move you will lose that health but if you pull off the special move you don't lose the health so it's a risk reward in streets of rage 4 whereas yes. in this game it's purely just risk because you're essentially just eating For away sure. your own life and if you're not doing substantially more damage to everyone else you're essentially wasting your time and it just felt it felt like as much as my lives were getting eviscerated anyway, they were getting eviscerated even faster when I decided to get some special moves out. And that just wasn't a good feeling. No. And to be honest with you, Anders' special move wasn't that great. I didn't find it that helpful. That was another reason I liked him a lot was his special move feels weaker, almost like on purpose to make his normal moves better for... Maybe he's like the character aimed at the noobs like us, you know? <laughs> Probably, yeah, because you can just kind of just mash his way through um, and, and really take people down. But, you know, like, it's certain enemy types, like the women who, like, do dive kicks at oh you. Oh, my and, God. And then the big round guys who roll at you and the guy in the dinosaur suit. What about the women that spank your ass? Uh-huh, yeah, they do that as well. Oh, or the <laughs> um, the ninja the ninja guy who, if you try and jump at him, he'll always slash you so you can't do a oh, jump dive God. kick to him. Um, yeah, lots of really annoying enemy types. The clown picking you up by your ankle oh yeah yeah so yeah i mean it's good the thing is like i think if you like this type of game and you like the hardcore classic side-scrolling beat-em-up type of deal you'll have a great time with this because it's really lovingly created great visuals great soundtrack like it has all the uh, you know hallmarks of one of these it's just i i'm not here for one of these right i'm here for one of these when it's a streets of rage 4 that has modernized things and has like modes that appeal to a person who just wants to go through and see it once through yeah. right i'm not the type of person like guillaume on rfn who will play through these games 20 times right if, and just keep going for high scores if you get a complete game over in streets of rage 4 i'm pretty sure you start at the same stage again anyway right if you don't you start do the yes whole game. so i think one thing this game could have just done with was like modern versus classic mode so classic mode you start the entire five levels again if you game over whereas they could have just had a modern mode or something some other name that just means you restart the level when you game over that would have i was constantly playing with the fear of having to play the entire game again and yes, even in totally. practice mode that's not a fun feeling um yeah and i think part of the reason was like i played the game on easy to begin with which easy only gives you like four lives and five continues and i died i think on stage end of stage three or something like that and i had to start the entire game over so i was like oh boy uh, let me just warn bali about this because he's not going to like this i know this um so so yeah i did have to kind of go through half the game again which was and the thing is like it's only like an hour long right so yeah. it's not like it's a huge loss or anything but 
Oh, I think because sure. it's not my genre, because it's not the type of thing I'm usually in for, I'm kind of like, I f- it feels a bit more like a slog. We said we, we like roguelikes, but not in this sense. <laughs> no, yeah, exactly. Yes, <laughs> totally. Yeah. Oh, boy, I didn't even think of it in that, that way. But um, anyway, uh, I think if you will know if you like this type of game. Um, and if you do, I think it's definitely actually something I can recommend because, you know, it's a well-made one and, it, yeah. and it's really cool. And Barato... Uh, so. Get back to the Mega Man stuff, the boss fight. Yeah. We, we like those. We know you got to pay the bills with this game. Well done for making a great game. But, you know, it's not a cup of tea. We want the no. we want the, the action platformer. For sure. But that is uh, Super Punch Patrol. Uh, and it's on the eShop. Very cheap. So check it out if you like the sound of it. Um, then, Valley, the Mario Collection came out. Now, obviously, we're doing our big feature on the three Mario games. And we'll talk about at the end of the show our plans for, like, when we're doing that. Maybe I'll just say now, we're doing Mario 64 next show. Um, so, you know, get your comments in about Mario 64, either on our Discord or our email address. Um, and, um, and, yeah, give all of your opinions on how you feel about Mario 64 in this day and age. I wanted to just talk about the collection as a whole, because yeah. um, we've both played a bit of all of the games. Um, I'm the most deep into 64 at the moment, but I have touched Sunshine, I have touched Galaxy, both in handheld and in docked mode. How are you feeling about this collection, Bally? What do you think? As a whole, it's a strong package, but it's a strong package because the games are so strong. I think... All three of the games have their minor issues that we can get into just now, like in terms of cameras, controls, replacing this with that and doing yeah. all the little things. And that's not maybe a fault of the collection because I think some of those things, <laughs> because they've taken the shortcut of porting these games rather than remaking them, there's a lot of issues with even all three games that could be avoided with slightly more ground up remakes. And I think that's the most frustrating thing about this collection is that um sure these three games are fantastic and they were really great on their original uh hardware but there are emulation aspects with all three that could be improved to make them even better games yeah um and i think that overall they all look really good right like really do i it's funny because mario 64 on ds was a game that you know i associate i guess with handheld right because i never played mario 64 on a big screen and so i feel really comfortable playing mario 64 on the switch handheld it it kind of feels natural in a way um because that's kind of what i've been used to growing up um but i did go back and check out mario 64 ds and that game actually does a lot visually to improve uh, the experience, right? Like, the Bowser model is a much more modern version of Bowser, which they just... This game, they just haven't done anything to, right? It's literally just the game. They put it there. They didn't even make it 16 by 9. Like, it's still 4 by 3. Um, so, so those are the types of things where... I think, for me, actually... I haven't been too bothered by the camera in Mario 64 because similar to Galaxy, it kind of does it for you, right? Like there, there is a almost natural sense in which the camera will just follow Mario wherever you are going and you don't necessarily need to have it like behind the back all the time. It's one of those things that in some senses, Mario 64 feels more like an isometric game than a third person game in yeah. the modern sense of things you know yeah. right like i'm thinking i'm thinking about like cold cold mountain when you're sliding down the hill you slide down that corner you go round the corner and you see mario from the same perspective as he rounds the corner right like it doesn't go behind him it shows you just that view of the slide the whole time down um so so i think it works fine for the most part and i haven't really had huge issues with it there's certainly moments where it's like oh for god's sake like why is this in this weird place and like turning the camera sometimes it'll be like i want to turn it to the left but it turns out it doesn't let you you have to turn it all the way around to the right so you have to do like four notches to the right instead of going one to the left which it won't let you for whatever right, reason right. i don't know if that's lack of two getting stuck on geometry or what but it seems like without rhyme or reason because it happened to me in bob on battlefield where there's like no walls around you so yeah i don't know yeah it's, i agree it's a lot of personal preference just kind of like cameras and things but it does sound like you've had a little bit of frustration and i would say just think what a 64 ground up it doesn't even have to be hd but just a remake would do that put a camera on a stick for 64 like i think it would just change a lot about how the game feels and that would probably make the game stronger in a modern context because i think 64 actually feels really good but then the camera in parts uh i found kind of hurt in many aspects and you are further than me so 
I'm only about 20 stars in, but like mm-hmm. there's even times where it's just been like, why is the camera like this? And I've gotten used to, you know, Odyssey, Sunshine, etc., of playing with a camera on a stick and a 3D platformer. Uh, and that being taken away feels like a step backwards that's very hard to do in a modern setting. Yeah, it, it's frustrating, but I don't know. Like, I, people played Mario 64 fine back in the day. And, and I think about it, on DS, we didn't have a camera stick on DS, right? Like, we had the touch screen, um, but there wasn't, like, three. even 3DS doesn't have that unless you get the little stupid nubbin. So the, the DS remake, I believe, you could press the L button and the camera would realign behind Mario. Centers, yeah, that's Centers. true, yes. I don't even yeah. think that feels the same on this version this no because i believe if you press the shoulder button it goes into like the kind of close-up camera mode where you can yeah have you done the star where you get the wing cap uh i mean i've got the wing cap i just haven't finished the red coins or okay, well, you've done the yet. bit where you look up in the sunlight yeah yes i have right. yes it took i had to bloody look up how to look up into the sunlight because <laughs> of the camera like first person swapping thing it's ridiculous because you you got like lucky two mode and mario mode you have to go into mario mode and then you have to press up on this on the equivalent of the c stick the c pad to look up it just feels really weird yes um, it is yeah it's it's not very natural yeah um but like if you're leveling those criticisms Bali, i've got to level the sunshine criticisms because fucking hell <laughs> um Okay, so, like, I am very well known for shitting on Mario Sunshine on this show, uh, with good reason, because it's a bad video game made by bad people. Um, I'm sure we'll go into depth on Mario Sunshine. And I, you made a tweet about how Mario Sunshine feels fantastic to play, and I just cannot disagree more in terms of... The, the fluidity is there. But can you argue that it doesn't feel the most similar to play as Odyssey? Not really, no, because Odyssey's a good video game. No, um, it feels... The, out, of these, out of these three, it feels the most similar to Odyssey by much. Yeah, it pro- it pro- you're right. It probably does feel, in terms of the move set and the tool set... He feels, Mario feels positively doughy in Galaxy, I would argue. Doughy? doughy. Jesus, that's a real not... I Honestly, Galaxy has the one thing that makes it really subtle is the spin, right? It, it just allows for that level of nuance in the platforming that isn't... Yeah, I mean, his... His doughiness works for that, but if you're talking about like fidelity and controlling Mario, he does feel doughy, and that works for Galaxy. But you're, you're right in the terms of like Mario 64 and Galaxy are the most similar in terms of control, versus Sunshine and Odyssey probably are more similar in terms of control. Just yes. in terms of, I would say in terms of complexity of the move set. My problem isn't with fluidity or complexity of the move set. It's about like the ways in which this game has not been adapted to modern standards when you control certain aspects of it right so things like controlling the shooting of flood because you don't have the gamecube analog button it has now been split between one button for running one button for standing still yeah and when you're standing still when you hold it the the but the stick you use to control where flood shoots is not the camera one which would be the logical thing to do it instead the the stick that you use to move mario is the one that you use and it just defies all feeling of reason and logic and does not feel good it i'm sorry it feels terrible um and it's really hard mario sunshine is so tricky to get your head around how this game moves and and the way that it feels it is a steep learning curve and i honestly don't think that once you get it it feels that good because i feel like i have it more under control now um and See, like, i jumped straight in and i was already this feels great because I'm, I'm very used to that mario sunshine control the only thing i had to get used to and it is a weakness of this port is as you say the analog versus click down stick for a flood but otherwise i think it it feels fantastic i think there is a real merit to the complexity of the moveset in sunshine like the spin jump the reverse i I wish they had made it easier to actually get your head around because it feels really unintuitive is the thing right like i like games that the controls make sense, right? They just, that you click with them, they, they're understandable, they're logical. There's no logic to Mario 64 and how it feels. Um, I do also think that it is a you bit sunshine, too... You said 64. Sorry, Sunshine, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I do think it's a bit too sensitive as well, right? Like, in terms of how Mario moves on a dime, like, I think some people would argue that it, it, it feels great. 
but we're not at that odyssey level yet with sunshine we're not at that level where it does feel like absolute perfection it's really like a li- little too sensitive where like the, even the slightest nudge of the uh, analog stick will do you like a forward backward flip over the top and using a spin in the air and it's just it just goes on a bit too much you know i think it's i don't know i'm man. interested like, to see what you think by the end of the game because i think that you you will get used to the move set and it is an incredibly unique feeling mario out of these three in that sense so i, I it is totally personal preference um yeah for sure yes, and i absolutely. i think out of the the three games my f- like the my favorite feeling and the favorite camera is sunshine for me because you do have that and you do have the analog stick for the camera um but also like as i said i, I do enjoy the move set of sunshine and yeah um yeah you say that but then these this analog stick for the camera doesn't go low enough to the ground like i always feel myself be like i, I need it just to zoom go, in press bit, up just go, it'll zoom, no, it'll zoom in like, behind him it doesn't it doesn't feel good like I, i'm trying to get a little bit more view of like the up of the camera it doesn't quite go down far enough you know what i mean it it doesn't i mean it, like it has this illusion of a modern platformer without any of the actual things that make it good right it's 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 the thin veneer of what it could be and i think that sunshine like this of all three of the games in terms of modernizing it like making the level design better like adding these kind of wind waker hd style elements to it would have had the biggest impact because i think actually at its core mario 64's design for the most part stands up sunshine's just doesn't right like there are multiple tens of levels where i think and i'm like oh no i i, I don't want to play that you know I, I i dread getting to that part i don't want to do that section and there are very few shines in sunshine where i'm like excited to go do well, now we're getting into the like most part the wider definition oh, yeah. of sunshine yeah, we'll sure, get to that sure, with sure. that game but yes. um my another issue i have with this collection we'll move on to galaxy is star bits i don't like star bits i i think this collection has made me realize what a added on gimmick star bits actually are and so i was prepared to so playing galaxy handheld i was like this feels good this is great really enjoying galaxy it looks incredible sounds incredible uh galaxy does feel really good um and but the and i was i was thinking oh yeah there's star bits in this game oh yeah you collected the star bits with the motion controls and then i thought oh i could just ignore the star bits and just play it normally and then i thought but you need the star bits to unlock the damn levels and i realized this is probably one of my biggest gripes with galaxy overall and in particular this collection is um star bits and using the the motion controls in order to collect the star bits like it's a shame that you cannot play this game in handheld mode with the joy cons attached to your switch like you can with the other two games that is a real frustration and uh, y- it- yes you can what are you talking about i've been playing it in handheld mode with the joy cons attached yes, of to the course, switch. but you have to like touch on the touch screen yeah that's fine it's really that's- it's, it's not that hard right but touching the touch screen spends a star but as much as it collects one I have not found that to be the case. Um, I don't know. I have played a bunch of Galaxy and Handheld. It's the sort of thing, again, a remake that could have just removed Star Bits and Mario Galaxy would be just as good, if I, not see, better. I honestly. don't. I disagree. I actually really disagree with you on this point. I really like Star Bits. What do Star Bits add to Mario Galaxy? They add a feeling of um, joy in the deep mechanical sense of like you are going around this wonderful place and you collect them. They make a really nice sound. They rumble a little bit on the Joy-Con. Like there is a real kind of primal mechanical joy to collecting star bits and i actually really disagree with you i really like it and i think maybe it's because they feel so tacked on they're like a, they, they're like they a don't feel tacked on to me the no end of the, produ- the production process almost to like um indicate you through points at levels like coins would have been done traditionally in mario it just feels so... but like honestly honestly it lends that sense of of space and like uh, awe and wonder of like all these little kind of fragments right this is the type of thing that appeals to me most in video games is the tiny little details that just make them have that much more polish and sheen if you take star bits out of the game i swear to god it is a worse feeling game um, and this is not to say that they've done a good job of implementing collecting star bits because the joy cons don't feel as good as a wemo is part of the they problem. don't but th- that said having played galaxy with the joy cons it feels just like it did on the wii for me for the most part right you will have to recenter it but that's a very easy click of the button i just and mean the sensitivity once you have recentered is it feels slower there's like a lag versus an actual wemo i don't know i haven't felt that oh honestly. there definitely is yeah 
I, I, yeah, I, I certainly haven't felt that. I've, I've really enjoyed collecting Star Bits, but that's with the caveat of doing that with just split Joy Cons playing on the uh, docked mode, right? Yeah. When you're playing in handheld, yes, you do have to use your, your touchscreen, and that's fine. That's, that's a, shame a shame that I think they could have avoided in a remake. And, and I think the worst is playing with the Pro Controller. It just feels weird, yeah. right? Because you have this hovering kind of icon that's all around the middle of the screen that doesn't really work. It just feels a little bit off and and i wish there was a way to kind of just get rid of it and then only activate it when you wanted to collect star bits yeah but totally it it doesn't seem like that's kind of built into the game they re- they could have done a better job of remodeling it i agree with you i just disagree with the idea that star bits getting rid of them would make the game better because i don't think so i think actually well it's not something i care about when i'm playing the wii version because it, it does feel so easy and so natural and does add yes. a bit of pizzazz like you were saying it adds a bit of um um immersion in the like the rumble and um interacting with the level but when you actually think about the actual mechanical nature of these levels they don't actually add to the mechanics of how you get around the level or what no, you're of course actually not. doing in the level right it's, it's like throwing away uh, rubbish in the bin in astral chain does that add anything to the game the narrative no of course not it just feels good to do right and sometimes you just need things that feel good to but do then give astral chain an alternate control method that forces you to throw rubbish in the bin a certain way and all of a sudden you're like yeah i'm not so sure you know it's the same that's essentially what you're forced to do in galaxy yeah no i, I know i know what you mean but but what i will say is that there is still an option to play it in the traditional way like you did with the wii like that still does exist and to me it still feels just as good and maybe that option is there i, d- I disagree that it feels just as good there's a lag on the joy con versus using a wiimote okay I, I, I mean i'm the one who's more sensitive to controls and i have not felt that that's why i'm surprised i'm making this argument because it yeah, definitely it's weird. is slower yeah i mean it's it to me it's kind of just it's fine it, it does the job but anyway galaxy looks crisp as fuck man like oh my goodness it really shows that the art style and the design of that game from the beginning was just made so you could very easily convert it to hd and it just looks looks better than a lot of modern games right yeah. like honestly it is startling how sharp and beautiful even that in game standard is when it came out it just looked hd in like this weird artistic way that they just the bloom on like the the planets and the lighting was just very impressive to the point where you were like I don't really mind I don't own uh, another, uh, you know, an Xbox or a PlayStation at this point in time because it just looked that good even back in 2000 and when it came out, six. Seven, I think, Seven, was the yeah. first Galaxy, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, obviously we will uh, get deeper into all three of these games um, and, and talk about them as actual video games and not just the port aspects of them. But overall, Bally, are you disappointed by it? How do you feel about it? Like... I think visually no. they have surprised me. You're right. 64 looks a lot crisper and cleaner than I thought. Um, if you're going down the route of we're just going to be making ports, I think they've done about as good a job as you can between what we've said about star bits and the different nozzles with sunshine and the camera in 64. Like if you're just going to port them, they've done a good job. Uh, but I think it, having played all three, there are little aspects, like I've just said, with the star bits, with the nozzles, with the cameras, that I think remakes could have just really improved all of these aspects to make a much more complete package and ultimately make three classic games more appealing to a modern audience, where I think there'll be plenty of people picking up games like 64 and Sunshine, especially the first for the first time and thinking, ooh, yikes, like this is how games used to be and you know and i think even those people will feel a bit weird about galaxy with the star bits and kind of like what are we doing here you know like i think there's just some modern touches that they should have done in remakes that i think i don't want to let nintendo off the hook for (laughs) yeah no for sure um and to say something nice about sunshine uh it does look very crisp right like it looks really nice um you know and they made it widescreen it's got the biggest levels out of any of them by like a mile it's actually crazy how and we were just checking there's only like seven nine levels did we say yeah something like that i can't remember they're but huge. they they're pretty big and they do it's different to 64 that they actually change what's inside them for for a lot of them but um yeah uh i i'm definitely happy to be replaying this stuff and you know i've never actually played original mario 64 before we both grew up with the ds version so it's an interesting experience and i i have been enjoying like remembering a lot of things that i feel are like lodged in the back of my brain somewhere and being like oh i remember what this star was and how i get this and just very lot of little quirks uh to that game but um 
yes, we will. Again, we will be talking about Mario 64 next week on the next in two weeks. So next time on the show. Uh, so yes, uh, send your emails and send your thoughts on our Discord, and uh, we'll remind you of that at the end of the show. But that's going to close us for the first segment. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back after the break, chatting through some of your emails. See you in a bit. everyone and welcome back to the second segment of today's show it is time for some emails uh, we've got a decent amount of emails but we always need more as we always say so please send your emails to this nintendo life at gmail.com that is this nintendo life at gmail.com you can also send us a comment in our discord server link to that in the show notes if you want to access that and we've got a great old community going on over there would highly recommend checking it out it's it's a fun time but our first email this week is from ryan p who says hey mbz and bally fairly simple question although maybe hard to answer for you today what is each of your favorite games for each nintendo console not looking for what you think the best game is on each console but just your personal favorite here's my list so we're going to go along with ryan's list and do our own at the same time so for the uh nes ryan has said Mega Man 2 and says my grandparents owned the system when i was young and Mega Man 2 still holds great memories for me playing it at their house doesn't hurt that it's a great game that still holds up mbz what mm-hmm. is your favorite nes game Well, I'm glad that Ryan has chosen the definitive correct answer for the best NES game because it is definitively Mega Man 2. There is no other answer. It's the only correct answer. Um, I think for me, and I've talked about this a lot before, people who are Nintendo fans are like, man, Nintendo, all these franchises started on Nintendo, like Zelda and Mario and Metroid. And I think all three of those Nintendo games that are their flagship franchises are all kind of bad as terms of nes games so i just don't and all improved radically i would argue on the super nintendo yes exactly 100 percent um versus stuff like Mega Man and castlevania which were improved to some degree but also i think were kind of perfect in their initial format um and so those are the types of experiences i gravitated much more towards in terms of nes stuff that i've played um so i think another shout out would be for the castlevania games either the first one or, or castlevania 3 um but of all the Mega Mans, uh, i would say two and five are my favorite of what i've played so far and i've played the first five um, i need to play six that's still on the legacy collection i need to get to it but um but yeah Mega Man 2 obviously for sure 
Well, I've played incredibly few games on the NES, as I think I've said numerous times on the show. I think we both have generally. I mean, you've, you've played generally, yeah. I think I probably dipped a bit more into it yeah. just because I, I like those other types of games, um, and you know, I, I gravitate towards the Castlevania stuff. But I, you know, I've I've dipped in. I have played the original Mario Brothers all the way through, and you know that ambassador program on 3ds had a bunch of these too so i've you know i've dabbled with balloon fight which is probably up there in terms of one of the better nes games and i played some ice climber which is not very good and not particularly fun these days so a lot of those types of games especially the kind of black box nes games stuff like golf and tennis were incredibly simple um at the start of the generation and and obviously you get to a point of mega of uh, sorry mario 3 mario 3 is a really impressive game to the point where i don't really understand how it runs on an nes or like because it's very very good visually and, and stuff like that but uh but yeah i'm not as we know not the biggest fan of mario 3 so my pick is also mega man 2 even though i am nothing like as hot on it as you are mbz yeah i don't like, think you actually like mega man 2 that much so this is i mean it's this fi- shows it's how game. few it's nes games game. you've played is that this is default the answer yeah it's not it's probably not making like my top 100 to be honest <laughs> that's uh, wild to I me think... this is easily like a top 20 game of all time yeah so anyway i think we've said enough about kind of our thoughts on NES. Bali, i think we need to find you an nes game you love i think that should be a mission of the podcast going forward i mean can I we find balloon fight and i enjoyed balloon fight quite a bit but i would, would you I, was... I would i think that's a more legitimate answer for you then i think you should say balloon fight and yeah. not Mega Man 2 i mean i like Mega Man 2 a lot not a lot a lot said strong words but and also <laughs> see balloon fight is going to be my nes game it's like balloon fight it's great balloon do you remember fight. when we did that competition back and forth to see how far we could get in balloon fight Come on, Bally. Yeah, what system Choose... was that on? I think that was 3DS we did it on. Or maybe it was... I think we recorded it on an emulator, actually, because we did a video on it, so we recorded it on an emulator. But the, it was also... I remember when Iwata passed away. Obviously, Balloon Fight was a game he had a lot of um, uh, involvement, involvement with. Yeah. And so I remember sitting there after he passed away that summer playing Balloon Fight on my 3DS. Um, but then we did a video together where we did it on my laptop, I believe, on an emulator. We recorded yeah. it. So All right. Um, I think you convinced me. I did enjoy Balloon <laughs> Fight. <laughs> And I love how I've had to convince you of your favorite NES. This is how game. not strongly I f- how much I care about the NES, I guess. But yeah, yeah, let's go balloon fight. Great, uh, that sounds good to me. Super Nintendo. Uh, Ryan says Super Mario RPG: Legend of the Seven Stars. To this day, one of my favorite games of all time. Uh, SNES is hard because there are so many games, RPGs in particular, I love on this system. But this one has so much charm and was wonderful from beginning to end. Super Nintendo is really hard. Um, and again, it's one of those where you have the trifecta of the Nintendo games, which most people are like Super Metroid, Link to the Past, Mario World. And I'm like, they're all great games. But really, the Super Nintendo is about JRPGs, right? Like, that is where it kills it. Absolutely. Some of the best games ever made uh, RPGs on the Super Nintendo. And so for me, it's a toss up. But I think so i could either go chrono trigger or i could go earthbound and i think really i'll probably go earthbound just because chrono trigger i played it on ds as opposed to on super nintendo so i've not actually played the super nintendo version of chrono trigger um even though i might put that higher these two are so close in my mind they are they are both just perfect at what they do and and are amazing so i'd probably say earthbound overall uh i'm gonna go earthbound as well uh it's probably my favorite Super Nintendo game, although Super Metroid comes very close. Donkey Kong Country comes very close. Yeah. Uh, I really enjoyed Final Fantasy VI and Chrono Trigger, but I do think Earthbound is probably the one I had the most fun with out of that group. Um, and hey, I've got a JRPG on my list, so that's cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah very rare. Um, but Earthbound, I don't know. Earthbound is a supremely special game. It's just so it's unique. weird, man. It's such a weird thing. And the fact that I like it so much, I think, speaks to the surprise and the delight that it, it has as well. as It's just incredibly charming. Like, the writing is great. It's very funny um, and, like, has a bunch of commentary as well. It's just, yeah, really, we should really great game. say we've also not played Super Mario RPG, but it's no, a game yeah. that we should definitely try at some point. I've watched it play through of it a while ago, obviously, because I've watched a play through of every game, as you all know. <laughs> um, but but yes, I would like to give that game a shot at some point. Made by Square Enix, right? Like Nintendo didn't make Super Mario RPG; that was farmed out to Square. They literally made it. So 
you know, Square Enix have a good track record on the Super Nintendo, so I'm sure that game still pretty good to this day. So we're going to N64. Mm-hmm. So Ryan says, Super Smash Brothers. Uh, toss up between this and Ocarina of Time, but N64 came at a time in my life where my friends and I would play so many multiplayer games together. N64 definitely had a plethora of them, Smash Brothers being one of the best. Yeah. Uh, I never owned an N64, so this is an interesting choice for me. Do you want to go first, Bally? Um, yeah, again, I don't feel overly strongly about this. There's lots of games I have a lot of nostalgia for that I arguably don't hold up in the best way, but I have gone back to this game a few times since playing it, just for like a little bit, like when I've had my N64 or whatever. And it's probably like Pokemon Snap for me. And it was also my first N64 game. Now, I have played Ocarina of Time 3D Remake, which I I don't think I can really count, to be honest, because I do think they do a lot of stuff to improve on the game. Um, Up there as well as like Wave Race 64, I think we both had a blast playing that game as part of our backlog club. Um, Game rules. It's a great game. I had to put a bit of nostalgia into this one, so it had to be Pokemon Snap. I did prefer that to, you know, the Mario Sports games at the time and Pokemon Stadium 1 and 2. Those were like probably my top five games at the time so on n64 on but yeah and because i'm intrigued what have what have you gone with yeah someone who never owned an n64 i have to go with the nostalgia pick which is pokemon stadium one slash two whichever one they're both great right they both serve the same purpose which is take our teams from the game boy games and fight them against each other in 3d amazing uh and also do stupid mini games um I was chatting with a work colleague recently about the Jigglypuff mini game where you have to count all the uh, Pokemon that go past the screen and you have to, or is it Cleffer? I can't remember. You're it's one of the them, Pokemon. Yeah. yeah, and you have to like count how they, they go past and you have to like tap on your um, uh, game pad the number of ones that you see go past. Uh, that's uh, a funny, funny uh, memory. So, yeah, we played loads of those games back in the day and so i feel like i almost did own them myself and everyone knows the story about how i went to burger king just to play pokemon stadium on the n64 that was at the burger king uh so yeah i think it has to be the stadium games for sure uh ryan says for gamecube paper mario thousand year door gamecube had so many amazing rpgs but this this takes the cake skies of arcadia and tales of symphonia are right up there as well very JRPG uh, centric here from Ryan, and also Mario RPG centric. Got seven stars on uh, Super Nintendo, and then Paper Mario on GameCube. Loving it. What have you gone for, MBZ? This is really hard. Uh, there's a lot of very good GameCube games, and ones that I personally connect with. I think I'm gonna go with Soul Calibur 2. When I really wow. come down to it, my the time that I spent. I thought you'd say Melee. And this is, yeah, Melee is definitely there, but I think the time that I spent with Soul Calibur 2, it just defined that generation for me in terms of a game that I would very much made my own in terms of I went through all the Weapon Master mode and we always played at multiplayer over each other's houses. I remember going to Ali T's place for his birthday once and us having a massive tournament of Soul Calibur 2 with a bunch of his friends and, and stuff like that. Remember him doing Hihachi impressions, jumping off the bed? Oh yeah, no, of course you, yeah, you ha- like, have to have that. LAT. This is why you've yeah, only just been allowed fighting games. You totally. need to chill out. <laughs> it still remains, I think, the best Soul Calibur game in terms of single player content and characters, and even look. Like you go back to it today, it still looks fantastic. It's got real it's style. Just, it has great style. A fantastic game, and I played Soul Calibur six right yeah six is the one that i have on steam and um i've had a great time playing that recently with playing as Geralt from the witcher which he's a great character to include in that game um and yeah it's the game that made me care about fighting games that weren't called smash brothers even though it's like the only other franchise fighting game wise i do care about so <laughs> so yeah soul Calibur 2 and um, the other one that would be close aside from smash melee would be fire emblem path of radiance which i would say is probably a top five fire emblem game for me and i only played it a few years ago i didn't play it on an original gamecube i had to emulate it because trying to find a original copy of that game is next to impossible unless you want to be gouged out your ass in terms of pricing um but phenomenal fire emblem game so that's nice. honorable mention mine's very boring again it is obviously wind waker uh wow bali i'm shocked what i would truly say about surprised. wind waker is having played it when it came out and then having played the hd version um back in 2012 i want to say when that game came out um 
I'm very satisfied with how well that game aged and I'd like to probably I should probably play it again like in this upcoming decade I guess and I think it's a it's a Zelda game that has aged very well I think in comparison to the Breath of the Wild it is kind of not difficult to go back to but it's a very different type of Zelda but if you're talking about traditional Zeldas it is still like my favorite and Wind Waker is just a fantastic game uh, if you've not played it I mean it's kind of hard to access now when you think about it if it is on, mm, on yeah Wii U. it is you Hey, it's the sort of thing that I'm sure will come to Switch at some point if they do a Zelda collection next year or even if they do Wind Waker standalone. Um, that HD version is very much worth picking up at some point. So, yeah, Wind Waker. So good, I beat it in three days. Yeah, you know, you, that's how you good it is. Bloody love that game. It's great. It's really good. Um, the we, Wii. Wii. Um, Wii. So, Ryan, sticking with the JRPGs here, has gone for Xenoblade Chronicles. Holy cow, I love this game when it came out. Replaying the defini- definitive edition on Switch now and still enamored by it. Uh, Ryan proving he has excellent taste, not <laughs> only with Mega Man, but also with Xenoblade. Obviously, it's Xenoblade. Of course, who else am I going to say? Xenoblade Chronicles. This is the best game of the decade, you know? I mean, come on. It's... it's um yeah it's it's a great game it's uh it's still like i think the thing with xenoblade is i was interested going back to it to play it this year for the definitive edition of like you know i've watched a bunch of these cutscenes a loads of times uh just because i watched other people play the game stream it whatever reactions um and you know i i feel like i know it pretty inside out is is the playing of it going to be as enjoyable and uh yeah absolutely it's not only that but it's even better than i remember in terms of because now i know the battle system and i understand it i can just break things right like i can roll in with melia and just start smashing fools and it felt fantastic and it's also great to do the kind of bonus stuff from the dlc slash epilogue thing because that whole area the one on a shoulder is one of those kind of things in terms of the history of the game that has always been fascinated me like it's this section between these two areas that makes way more sense for them to have gone to in the actual game but they got cut from development and stuff like that so yeah it's uh it's fantastic it's obviously my favorite wii game what about you Bowie? mine is mario galaxy 2 uh but i must admit having just started galaxy 1 on the nintendo 3d mario all-stars collection I do have more nostalgia for the first game, but yes. quintessentially Galaxy 2 is a better game. But I think that what's interesting about Galaxy 1 is that it does go for the space theme a lot more. And when you're, when the, I, I find the big greatest appeal of Galaxy is almost like it's, it's Spectre, how it looks, the, the imagination with the levels. And in that sense, the impact of Galaxy 1 is much greater, but... I think I still have to give it to Galaxy 2. It is still the stronger game. And if I had to replay one right now, I'd probably want to play Galaxy 2 as much as I'm already playing Galaxy 1 because that's the one they gave me. Um, yeah. But yeah, why don't I just say both the Galaxy games, to be honest? Because yeah, you I think know. They both have their value. I said Pokemon Stadium 1 and 2. You can cheat. It's Let's fine. do 1 and 2. Uh, the Mario Galaxy Collection uh, because... Wait, what? Galaxy Two? I've never heard of that game before. Ballad. It doesn't. Um, <laughs> Nintendo don't think that, just forgot that about it. Their best, one of their best 3D platforms of all time. Just mm, forgot. About never it. heard of it. No, I don't think that computes. Unfortunately. Oh well. Never mind. Um, Wii U, Bally. Wii U. Uh, Ryan's gone for Super Mario Maker. While the sequel does a lot of cool things, the first was just so innovative and fresh. I enjoyed playing so many fun and challenging levels. I swear I didn't look at this list while I was writing mine. Uh, but yeah, Ryan, we're just on the same mind track here. A Super Mario Maker, of course it is. It is the game that basically justified the entirety of the Wii U existing, right? Like, it, I don't think there is any other game that makes use of the Wii U and its functionality as perfectly as Super Mario it's Maker. It's the only reason Jeff Grossman gets his, his Wii U out, he said. Exactly, yeah. Even to, even today, man, because Mario Maker 2 was a disappointment, right? So, you know. Mario Maker uh, 2 scratched that. my Switch screen. Like, it will never be forgiven. <laughs> always have a vendetta against mario maker 2 <laughs> because we both scratched our switch screens as a result of it definitely not the uh not our fault of course it's always the game's fault yeah of course my top wii u game is donkey kong country tropical freeze and ah uh, yes, yes i might have mentioned this game on the show before so I'm no i never heard keep, of it keep know. my opinions limited but it is one of the best uh 2d platformers of all time it's pretty good you should play it. i like it i th- i think um you know that moment when i played it and i was like oh bali wasn't just being a weird fanboy this is this game is actually very good <laughs> uh yeah definitely uh and then switch 
Ryan's gone for Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. I mean, is there another option? What an amazing game. And yeah, I think. Yeah. We agree. Um, I mean, yeah, all of us agree. Well, congratulations to all of us for agreeing on the correct opinions, which in fact, all of these are the correct opinions. All others are wrong. So there you go. That was fun. Uh, Ryan also said, I'll skip the handhelds since this email is already long, but you can bet the remake of Chrono Trigger for DS would be on there. As an aside, I just listened to the email you discussed about games getting ultimate treatment. You mentioned Star Fox since they've mostly rehashed the same game since N64. My favorite Star Fox game in the past decade isn't even a Star Fox game, but it's a Starlink, it is Starlink Battle for Atlas on Switch. Yeah. I think that would be a great send-off for the series, doing an open world or open star system game where you can fly through space between planets, but also have missions on worlds. Thanks for the great podcast, Ryan. I feel like I frequently see Chris Scullion tweeting about very cheap uh, Starlink ships on Amazon and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm intrigued. Yeah, I I mean, I do intend to play like No Man's Sky on Game Pass sometime and Starlink kind of has vibes of that about it and the whole sort of interplanetary exploration kind of game I do want to try more of and I agree that could maybe be the best send-off for Star Fox possible. Yeah, potentially. But um, anyway, if you want to hear our favorite uh, handheld game, just write in an email and ask us. Um, yeah. Yeah, we'll cover that another time. Um, our next email is from Justin W. He says, Ahoy, hoy, gents. What are your strange gaming habits and are any of them subject to ridicule? My mates always rip on me when we play a first-person shooter and I need to pause the menu to invert the Y-axis. When I play the Switch in docked mode... Uh, I will often just hold one Joy-Con in each hand and lay on my couch. My friends refer to this as the blob style of gaming. <laughs> I, re- uh, I refuse to play anything on a Sony console because I absolutely loathe the low positioning of the thumbsticks of the DualShock design. Uh, lastly, when I play Rocket League, I'm the only person I know who does not use ball cam. To my bud's surprise, I still lead, them, uh, lead all of them in points after nearly every game. Cheers, Justin. That last one really throws me. Like, how can you play Rocket League without ball cam? Like, that just really... When I first started Rocket League, I would, like, use the old the behind-the-back cam of the car, like, yeah. to, to kind of line up shots, and then I realized, actually, it's better staying in ball cam, more or less. Yeah, because, I mean, that thing goes all over the fucking shop, right? Like, it's very disorienting, Um, so that's that's definitely a unique habit i will i will say um bali do you have any i think both of us have observed each other of of certain things i'll go for the ones that i've self-observed in me and then i've got some for you but we can do the ones for you first if that makes sense but okay i do so there's ways i play games and then there's like things i do in games so the ways i play games i like to not try to play I try not to play too many games at once. I love keeping a list where I keep a list on backloggery on top of a Google Doc that has a list of games that I, sh- I constantly shuffle up and down saying, and then I've gotten to the point where I put in like release dates of, of games coming out and I'm like oh lining God. up, right, if I if I play this, I've got until this date before this comes out and then I can line this up and then once it's beaten, it goes into like a group of games at the bottom that I split into game of the year for both games this year and games that didn't come out this year. And this, this <laughs> is like a cycle that I've just been going on like, last year and a half more or less before it was just backloggery but now it's backloggery on top of this list and so i'm very systematic if you're wondering whether we are crazy people yes we are yes <laughs> basically but the satisfaction of beating a game putting it in the bottom half and then but say you say you're like oh Bally, i played this game it's really great i'll just maybe note down that game and be i'll just be on the bottom of like my games to play this year list and say it's a game on like game pass or something so it's just on my radar and then depending on its length i always like playing a short game alongside a long game i don't i try not to line up too many long games at the same time although this always happens at some point and it's about just kind of balancing this and getting satisfaction out of the hobby i guess it's it's weird anyway <laughs> other things i like doing We're lunatics I, and i get ridiculed a lot by him for this uh, and caroline actually because it's very frustrating for her to watch but I love going as slowly and thir- as thoroughly as possible through beginning game tutorials. I love to just soak it all in, make sure I know 100% what I'm meant to be doing, make sure I can like master the controls and then go from there. I hate skipping. The idea of, of missing something and then having to like look up, oh, how does this thing work when the game's already told you is like my idea of hell. Like I love knowing 
from the game itself and learning on on the path that they've set for me if that makes sense i i play I let me it. tell you people playing multiplayer games with bali recently like sea of thieves and grounded but ba- he goes into this weird panic mode of like oh i'm overwhelmed oh i don't know what to do oh i can't deal with it oh what's going on and it's just because you it's... forced me to skip tutorials in order to go at your speed when in reality i, I don't force you to skip anything i think for me i think I don't know. Maybe I just intuitively pick things up the, much faster. These games have the all, all, most of them have like a single player tutorial option for the right. future. I want you to give me a two day warning. You say, Bally, <laughs> we're going to be playing Astro Near. And I know for a fact that game's got a single player tutorial mode that I can jump yeah. in, learn it all, and then I'll, I'll be smooth as anything when we're playing multiplayer. It's simple. Yeah. Sword. It's, it's so funny. Just like playing Grounded with you is a great experience just because. It, like you had you one of the people the like point zero 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 one percent of people who has never played minecraft <laughs> in their lives right so it's not just we've said this before i've not played the most popular games of all time including like grand theft auto minecraft yeah. i've never call done like a single player call of duty campaign yeah so Anyway, it's not just a new game. It's the fact that Bali's literally learning the entire concept of a survival game. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, Bali, come on. Like, obviously, you have to eat this thing and then go over here and do this thing. And then we're going to craft this stuff. And you're just like, well, slow down, slow down. Where's my menu? How do I click on this? What's going on? <laughs> um, and I find it very funny when Bali's just in this panic mode of just like too overwhelmed. And then you talk to me about how you have stress dreams because you were too overwhelmed by it. And yeah, it's like... <laughs> uh, there was one night we were playing grounded until until about like ten thirty, and i normally go to bed about like 11 midnight and i was just struggling like hell to get to sleep and i <laughs> I, I swear i blame it on like grounded just because i was so <laughs> tense from like trying to pick it all up and yeah um other things i do in games i uh, i do like to fill out a map that's quite a common one that a lot of people like to do including yourself yes. yeah but i i don't like passing things and then coming back to them but at the same time, I don't like completely clearing out a map first time. So this sounds ridiculous, but like... <laughs> okay. I like to create almost like an aura around my character where I say, if you come within this radius, I'm going to do your side quest or your mission or whatever. But beyond that, I'm going to come back to it and pretend I didn't see it almost. Like it's like <laughs> this weird like... Because I, I don't want to just systematically do every single damn thing in this area before moving yeah. on to the next story quest. So I like to try... My way of forcing myself to mix it up is to do the side quests around me and then do the story quest. And then... So I, I, I struggled like this a lot with Ghost of Tsushima and like with Spider-Man on PlayStation 4 um, and with Breath of the Wild, actually. Like I really... It is like I want... I see that. I want to do it but not quite yet i want to do this one thing first and then if the one thing drags me to something else i'm like no 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 i've got to go back and do that thing i saw before otherwise i'm going to get drew- taken off path because i do think and to the to open world games credit i think one thing they're very good at these days is breadcrumbing you constantly into new paths that just make the world feel more they would argue make it feel more immersive uh but for me it just kind of completely disorientates you and kind of just i like to go back to where i was and not have to come back and constantly um redo things that i've passed if that makes sense sure yeah that's i don't know it's i definitely have the compulsion in certain games to do everything and fill out screens like it's mainly in 2d metroid style games where i'm like i gotta i can't have that gray square that square needs to turn purple i gotta admit when ori and the will of the wisp like i either glitched or i just wasn't able to access it or something we had this discussion and like there was like one gold thing i just couldn't get or wouldn't clear and i'm like yes oh, and i just had to put it away in my head like oh it still bugs dude me. same thing for me at the end of that game in terms of there's one area that you escape from there's the final escape sequence where part of that map was not cleared for me for whatever reason even though it should have been because i went through it and there's literally no way to get past that area oh, no. again and fill it in and so my completion and ori is stuck at 99 percent because there is something that i can't get that is there and that's terrible um hopefully they fix that uh on and i don't the think version. either of us are really trophy hunters or anything. no not at all and no like, tsushima was the first platinum i ever got and like i i do intend to probably platinum the remastered spider-man um just because i love that game so much but other than that i i specifically tried to pick 
or getting 120 shrines in Breath of the Wild. Like, I'm going to pick my favorite games of all time to do that for rather than just make it a, a compulsion thing because that is that is genuinely how you end up forcing yourself to play games you don't fully enjoy. And I think that is quite a bad habit. It can be, yeah. And it depends, right? It depends what type of player you are. Like, you've talked about how caroline loves to just do everything in a game right just like oh my god she she's like level current level 59 in horizon zero dawn and has like gone back to beat the game but before doing the end game she'd already beaten all the side quests and has done like the dlc um frozen wilds is like doesn't the dlc like spoil the ending of the game or does it not do that does it not kind of like go into that stuff um she said there was something story related that didn't add up that has now been revealed that she was like oh so i think it it probably would have worked better but yeah you can kind of do either way around but not perfectly i don't know It's, it's a bit weird um but yeah she's she's like so thorough and fine tooth combed through open world games is like frightening um and she's perfectly (laughs) prepared to spend like over double the time i would spend with um any given open world game and she's like still got ghost of tsushima red dead redemption 2 she's currently playing assassin's creed black flag um like she's got all these open world games like on the horizon that she's just very keen to play just loves open world games loves it it's great great um so some weird ones for me i did this video once um about how i hold video game controllers and about how i press i had this on my little list of things Uh (laughs) i said you flick your every time you get your ds out i remember Mm -hmm. this so distinctly it was your ds and then the 3ds you'd flick your thumbs you'd click the knuckles and then you'd pull it and you'd like flick your nails off like your other fingers and then you'd you'd like click your fingers and then you would use the middle of your knuckles to, on the d-pad and the buttons it's the joint so on my thumb my right thumb the joint between the top part of the thumb and the bottom part of the thumb that's the thing i use to press buttons in video games i don't use the actual squishy part of my thumb that is really weird to me i just don't do that although it tends to be if i'm rolling my finger like what if i'm holding my switch for example my the joint will be say on the b button whereas the the other part of the thumb will be on the y button so my thumb rests diagonally across the b and y buttons so that i constantly have the ability to be pressing b while also pressing y um, and this is, serves me very well in a lot of games and it, it makes it really easy to kind of jump and dash and i think it's why i like platformers with movement skills because the position of my thumb is so custom made to just make it really easy for me to play um so so yeah that's definitely a big one um i wrote down shouting fuck you at the screen when no one else is in the room and just being when i get annoyed at a thing i literally just talk out loud and like curse at the game um and i don't know if other people do this or not or if it's a weird thing like when you get annoyed at a game badly or like you fail a thing do you ever exclaim out loud or how does that go i do react physically and sometimes if i don't realize caroline's watching she'll be like are you okay <laughs> yeah I, I don't know I, I kind of will like yeah i'll get very tense and sometimes like do a half a half throw of the controller so hold it in one hand and just wallop it on the sofa or something but yeah <laughs> not, nothing too unusual i don't know yeah no i don't know it's i the thing is when i'm doing that it's like this really like instant like fuck stupid thing and then like i'm instantly all right i'm backing it again right like it's not i'm never like getting ang <laughs> actually it's not actual anger it's just like in the moment annoyance yeah. and frustration just being like expelled from your mouth um so um other weird things i'm a compulsive saver i will save my game constantly often all the time i will never be in a position where there- i always hear these people on podcasts being like man and then i lost three hours of progress because i didn't save and i'm like you're a lunatic <laughs> who does that and i think partially it's because of my experience growing up with memory cards and we all know that i had bad gamecube memory cards from third party creators and they often failed and lost my save data all the time in a bunch of games on gamecube and ever since then i have been very very stringent about making sure i have things saved and i don't switch off a game without saving it even if i put a ps4 into rest mode i will save the game before it goes into rest mode to make sure 
yeah, you should do that um, because otherwise you risk losing a bunch of progress, and I hate that. It's my least favorite thing. So, I yeah, and I I don't know how how much you do this, Bali, but I am just. It must be if I was to play games on like a stream or whatever that required this type of thing. I th- thankfully, these days a lot of games are auto save stuff, so it doesn't really make a yeah. difference. But if I'm playing an older game like Pokemon or whatever, I'm saving like every five steps or whatever. You e- even- know, like I'm an idiot. Even yeah. auto saves, I like them to say, and when you pause, it'll say like, it'll just have a little thing that says, "This game auto saved this how many minutes ago?" Yes, um, Hades you, does that, which is good, right? And th- but there's lots of games that don't do that, or they do auto save but don't tell you when they auto save and this sort of thing. And I, I like games that give you as much information as possible when you save. Um, I was listening to some developer, and I wish I could remember who it was, but they had an auto save system. But they still put a save button in the game that did nothing just because they felt for people like us it was important there was a button you could click that said save even though when you did that it did nothing it would just go back to the last auto save anyway which the game would do anyway right so yeah i do think there are probably more games than we think that do that probably Um, Um, but i'll still gonna if there's the option to hit save i will do it you know like i'm gonna do it um a um, couple others, I hate film grain. Film grain can go fuck off. If I can't turn off What's film grain... What's an example grain, other than Last of Us Part 2? Oh, there's a bunch of games that do it. Like, loads of games try and do, oh, we're cinematic. I'm like, fuck you, you're a video game. You're not a film. You do not need film grain. It makes games look fucking terrible. Which, which Last of Us Part you've 2. Not, you've not said. Huh? Which games? I don't know. It happens all the time. I can't bring it to mind, but because most of like the Tomb Raider games on PC, I had to turn it off. Oh, a okay, bunch right. of games, you know, like those type of games that are trying to be super cinematic. I will always go into the menus, find the film grain op- option and turn it off. It is terrible. It is bad. I don't understand why people do what, it. Why awful. is it bad? Because it just makes the game look worse. The thing with a video game, right, is you want it to look smooth and crisp, and at least I do. I want it to look as sharp as possible. And a game like Last of Us Part 2 looks fantastic to begin with. It just looks blurry and worse with film grain over the top. It simply does to me. And it's lunacy because you go into the photo mode in Last of Us Part 2 and you can turn off the film grain in the photo mode, but not in the menu when you're playing the game. It doesn't make any sense. And when I turned it off in the photo mode, I'm like, holy shit this game looks way better um it's yeah it's wild hmm. i don't care. are there others who share this opinion i feel like it because i did tweet about it and i got a lot of positive feedback from oh, people great. so i think there are people out there who hate film grain um and rightly so it's just with all those last of us options i'm so surprised i didn't just put it in it doesn't make any sense anyway thankfully nintendo don't make cinematic games so no <laughs> worries about film grain for them um and then the, the last thing is uh, options menu whenever i start up a game the first thing i do is i go into the options menu uh, partly it's a pc thing i think you know back in the day when i watched a bunch of total biscuit he the first thing he would do is go into the options menu to check for all the settings and stuff make sure it was a good pc port that type of thing but for me it's also like if i'm playing a first person game i'm going to the fov straight away i need to have good fov um but even on console uh, the first literally the first thing i do when i boot up a game is go and check the options um i don't know why it's just like it's it's kind of like prepping my experience almost it's like i don't want to start the game before checking the options and making sure you know subtitles are on and all that stuff i want to make sure my experience when i boot up the game is exactly how i want it to be so i'll sometimes purposefully not go into options because i'm worried about gameplay mechanic spoilers so like for fuck's sake this thing could lead to this is another thing i should probably say like i'm very sensitive to like spoilers beyond just plot and reveals like i really don't like knowing about areas mechanics characters (sighs) you name it like the more blind i can go into a game the better but at the same time i do tend these days i watch quite a lot of trailers um but yeah yeah we've talked about this before but yeah Sure, sure um i've got one that you used to do a lot (laughs) <laughs> you had this habit in games uh yeah this habit in driving games of going backwards around courses <laughs> because oh well oh, yeah i, mean, I think what would normally happen games. is i'd be winning or whatever you'd be driving yes. along fine then you might, might miss a corner you'd you'd screw up and then rather than like try and recover you just decide to start driving backwards around the course and yeah just... i'd just be like fuck you game i hate you i'm just gonna go backwards <laughs> just instead. Like a way and i think it would towel. really annoy you as well because you're like no try actually try and i'm like no i'm going backwards nah, 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 nah. <laughs> like an idiot of, you know? i'm sick of this double dash yeah exactly exactly so i would do that 
Um, I think you told me I puff up my cheeks a bunch when I'm playing games or something like that. Was that a thing you, I used to do? I swear you do it less now than you used to, but my god, like, the intensity going through your body during fighting games, especially like Smash Brothers when we're playing locally, <laughs> is is something to behold. Like, the amount of... Yeah, you are like... You are intense. Uh, that's funny. It's like... Um, it's really funny because I was skateboarding today with my sister, and I was trying to do a video of us both, like, holding my phone, like, doing a, a, a recording, and... Um, when you can see when i start skateboarding my lip just like goes into this like really focused like concentrated thing as if i'm like really like preparing myself to like push off that's your video game face that's totally your fighting game it must be it face. must be because i'm like putting effort in it's like the thing i do when i put effort in i guess it's really funny and i guess i still do it even today when skateboarding oh that's very that's very cool um for you, Bal, the one thing for you that always, like, I always thought about was whenever we were playing a video game, you had to be player one. You had to be <laughs> in the player one slot, and you would get really annoyed if you weren't. Um, and I don't know. Well, normally, because you were at my house, and I was, it was my off to my game, and it, yes, and then so say it was like a Pokemon Stadium or something, and some certain games only player one can control it. Right. I think the frustration was. If I'm player two, then they're going to be player one, and they don't know how this game works. It's going to be a nightmare <laughs> to start up the game for us, that sort of thing. Yeah, no, it's funny because also like playing as Mario, right, versus me playing as Luigi. Like you always be, I have I'm to always, be Mario. I'm, I'm going to be player one, no matter what. In Mario Golf and Mario Tennis and Mario Kart, always Mario, always player one. No one else is allowed to be player one. Mario basically, player with one. the rule, it's got to be. Ah, uh, yeah, that was funny. Um. So yeah, those are some of our weird video game habits. Some we've grown out of, some apparently we still do. <laughs> Very weird. Sure, I could think of more actually, but yeah, for yeah, another time. Yeah. Sure. Um, great. Well, I think that closes things out. Bali, before we uh, end the show, tell people where they can write in more emails. Please send your emails to thisnintendolife at gmail.com. That is thisnintendolife at gmail.com. We would really appreciate your emails. Yeah, and, and speaking of emails, you should definitely send in your emails for our celebration of Mario uh, with Mario 64. Where next show um, is going to be Mario 64. We're going to be talking about it. So send your emails to that email address. Um, and we want details, thoughts, ideas. Uh, what do you think about Mario 64 today? What were your experiences it, with it back in the day? And we will, we'll of course, read some of those uh, when it comes to talking about the game next time we do a show bally uh which is when it's going this episode is going to be episode 180 uh, and it's going to come out on october the 12th that is when we will be discussing mario 64 in detail yes so that will be in two weeks from when this episode goes up october the 12th will be our big mario 64 um kind of celebration discussion um talking about that famous video game and uh, and we also have kind of a roadmap bally right for when we're going to talk about the other mario games in this collection so, so you can tell people if that. you want to get ahead in your homework uh episode 183 which will come out on the 23rd of november is when we're going to do uh, a deep dive into super mario sunshine so we want all your comments on that game and your emails on that game as well and then because December is Game of the Year time and we're going to obviously do our Game of the Year discussions and when January comes around, we always do our predictions for January. Unfortunately, Mario Galaxy is not going to be until episode 187, which will come out on the 18th of January. So you've got a much longer time to play that game. But as we said, October 12th is Mario 64, 23rd of November is Super Mario Sunshine and 18th of January is going to be Super Mario Galaxy fantastic i'm excited i'm thrilled i'm terrified frankly about super mario sunshine i've already had a taste of that how many shines are you up to in sunshine uh this point i don't remember i don't remember and i don't want to remember really um but i will have to play that game in full and it will be a living nightmare but um i'm sure i'll sure <laughs> we'll I'll stream about about what more could you want yeah i'm sure i'll stream a bunch of that as well so people can enjoy my pain firsthand it will be wonderful um cool uh well this show is uh, coming to a close but we also want to thank some people who help us make this show and make uh, bonus shows as well our patrons of course on patreon.com slash this nintendo life bally we have some patrons we'd like to thank yes thank you to our ten dollar tier patrons they are zach s atari alex thomas 
Matthew and my fiance Caroline. And yes, thank you to all of our other patrons. All your support is hugely appreciated. And yeah, we just did our third episode of This Nintendo Life, uh, which you can subscribe to for a single dollar. And we were talking all about the prices for the two next gen systems coming out this November. So if you want to hear about that, we also went into spoilers on Ghost of Tsushima and spoilers on Tell Me Why. Uh, if you want to hear more content, it's a great place to go uh, just for a dollar if you want access to that show. Great, good stuff. Uh, obviously, you can find the show in various places across the internet. Uh, we're on iTunes, we're on Spotify, we're on pod something not Podbean. we're not on that don't just ignore that we're not on Podbean. um that's a website i think people like host things on Podbean sometimes anyway just don't think about Podbean. i don't know i keep saying Podbean. it sounds good it just is a nice word anyway uh you can find us on uh, alexa you can ask your alexa to play us we're on tune in uh you can uh go on, on podcatchers on the uh, app store and download us there we're all over the place anyway short long and short of it is just search this nintendo life in whatever you listen to us on you can subscribe to us this was a mess of a segment um and yeah listen it's a good show you just listen to it so you probably know that anyway um <laughs> thanks for listening everybody i bali i'm just i think this is the most mess i've made of the end of a segment possible i was just gonna say check out apple podcasts that would be a great place to review us we'd really appreciate yes. it Yes, thank you, Bali, for just getting us back on track. I'm, there. I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm keeping it level. I'm here. I'm here. It's good. This is, I focus. need you. I need you because sometimes I lose my mind and I don't know where it's going, and it just walks away from me. It grows legs. I mean, that's what happens when you talk about Mario Sunshine. This is true. This is true. Maybe this is a bad idea, Bali. This is going to turn out to be a bad. bad you know, plan. the other the other company, Sony, Microsoft, they are launching next gen gen systems, and Nintendo are like, hey play some mario so that's exactly what we're going to be doing yes absolutely uh, much better use of our time for sure uh okay well that's going to be it thanks everybody for listening we'll be back in a couple of weeks time with some more chat about the video games the nintendo and all the fun things that we talk about here until then we'll see you very soon bye bye folks interlude used on today's episode was Eurydice's song Good Riddance from Hades copyright Supergiant Games 2018 you know what pisses me off what London prices we had a croissant today that cost me two pound fucking fifty well, <laughs> because it was in the centre of London up in central London it was a hazelnut and chocolate like croissant it was actually really fucking nice but also i was like i paid two pound fifty for a croissant the fuck man i reckon there's plenty of places in edinburgh a croissant would also cost two pounds fifty i don't know i don't know it's just i don't think my brain can deal with two pound fifty for a croissant it's just wrong you know certain things in life they're just wrong and that's one of them